Ni Hao and welcome to episode 7 of my Mao's China vlog. Um, this time we're still in topic 2 which is looking at the economic um, or Mao's economic policies in China and uh, I guess in particular thinking about how successful they were in changing the Chinese economy. Remember that at the start um, of, uh, of Mao's era when the Chinese Communist Party were successful in the Civil War and established the People's Republic of China in 1949, the economy was relatively backward, backwards by global standards. The Nationalist Party that had been in power before um, the Second World War had tried uh, to modernise um, and had had some success in that in the 1930s, but much of that had been um, a in the uh, industrial cities of the East Coast and B uh, undermined by um, years of Japanese occupation uh, and then the civil war after that. To the um, uh, scene rather in the impact of inflation uh, when the Chinese Communist Party took power which was running at a thousand percent in 1949. And so the initial economic policy uh, of the PRC was to get inflation under control. By 1951, that had been accomplished. It was down to a, a manageable 15%, still quite high by modern standards. Um, and to do this, the uh, CCP had had to cut spending um, quite radically. They'd raised taxes uh, on uh, in urban areas and had introduced a new currency, uh, the yuan, uh, Y-U-A-N. But... In 1952, they were ready to start thinking about what do they want the Chinese economy to look like in the future. And so, of course, being a communist, Mao launched the first five-year plan. And this was um, no coincidence in terms of its labelling being very similar to the Soviet Union because Mao was looking to the Soviet Union for um, a pattern and for guidance about how to transform uh, the Chinese economy. The Soviets had successfully done that uh, themselves, um, starting uh, in the late 20s and then through into the 30s. Also, at a practical, so there's an ideological reason for that um, and a historical reason for that. And there's also a practical reason for that. The Korean War, which had started in 1950, had uh, meant that there was a, a grain embargo upon China, which meant essentially that, that the other sort of powerful Western nations were um, not uh, willing to trade with China anymore. And so um, the Soviet Union is the only, only kind of ally um, left standing. Therefore, in 1950, um, the, the Sino-Soviet Mutual Assistance Treaty uh, was signed between the Soviet Union um, and the People's Republic of China. And part of that uh, was uh, this quote here, to give all possible economic assistance and cooperation. And the Soviet Union do give genuine economic assistance and cooperation to the People's Republic of China, but they do also charge them quite um, uh, quite heavily for that. Um, the Soviets gave uh, the Chinese a loan of $300 million, uh, which needs to be uh, over five years, and that needs to pay back with interest. However, they do also send 11,000 experts to China um, to train and offer advice and technical help. Um, and they invite 28,000 Chinese technicians to study in Russia in order to learn from the elder brother, uh, uh, from their expertise uh, in the Soviet Union, who were at this stage technologically um, and industrially definitely ahead of, of China. The Soviet help resulted in the construction or reconstruction of 156 major industrial enterprises including seven iron and steel plants, 24 electric power stations, and 63 machinery plants. Some of these plants were constructed in the Soviet Union and then shipped to China uh, after they were built. So the Soviet help is um, significant uh, and useful, um, and it does help pave the way for the first five-year plan to be, broadly speaking, a success. And the aim of the first five-year plan was to increase heavy industry in particular, um, and it was to uh, improve it quickly so that China could become self-sufficient as soon as possible in coal and steel and machinery. This is partly because of the Western embargo and partly also because of a fear that they would need to defend themselves against uh, Western um, aggression in the future. And perhaps also uh, in the 50s, Mao still has hopes of launching an invasion of Taiwan and gaining that back. Uh, for the People's Republic of China. Certainly, a couple of times he uh, tests American resolve 
um, in what become known as the Taiwan Strait crises. Um, both times the Americans respond uh, in fairly emphatic terms. Um, the second time, um, Mao also manages to fall out with Khrushchev over nuclear weapons at the same time. So that was the plan's targets. Um, the successes uh, of the first five year plan um, are genuine. Um, and broadly speaking, you would picture it as a successful plan. Um, the annual growth rate of the economy at this time was 9%, uh, which was um, compared favorably to other economies around the world. Most of the targets were met um, and increased beyond that. Um, coal output, for instance, almost doubled. Steel output almost quadrupled. Um, electric, electrical power, electric power um, output increased two and a half times. Um, and also uh, geological exploration discovered resources like oil, uranium and minerals uh, in Xinjiang province uh, in the northwest. Xinjiang, if you need to mining, is spelled X-I-N-G, it's not spelled like that, X-I-N-J-I-A-N-G, that's right. Um, the Mao also puts uh, forward several um, large kind of infrastructure um, projects like the bridge over the Yangtze at Wuhan, um, which was famously built during this period. Um, and so there is, there's, there's a sense of morale boosting uh, infrastructure that you can see being improved as well. Um, living standards and job security, living standards were improved, job security was given to all workers. This is called the Iron Rice Bowl. Um, and the urban population was expanded to 100 million people, which meant that there was a bigger pool of workers. That was up from 57 million in 1949. But also having a, a, a larger urban population meant it was easier to control the population too. And so in this period, you also get the development of the um, putting the workers in Danway, D-A-N-W-E-I, which are kind of... Uh, groups, uh, factory groups, um, where they were given permits for welfare, travel, um, to get married. Um, it's a way of the, the Chinese Communist Party um, exercising social control over them. Um, nevertheless, there's also improved health and education and housing during this period as well. So broadly speaking, a success. There were areas, though, which you would point to and say mm, that success is not universal uh, or complete. For example, quality was often sacrificed for quantity and the targets of the five-year plan um, were about output rather than uh, usefulness or, or, or uh, there were no sort of quality controls put on them so that was what was measured and that was what was produced and if it didn't work or broke quickly that didn't matter to the producers there was also a lack of coordination between industry and the planners which led to problems within the um, the flow of work and production in the economy and bottlenecks in some places and um, lack of resources uh, in others. And that will be familiar to those of you that have looked at Soviet um, economic history as well. Um, you'll see similar sort of problems there. Uh, it should also be noted that the Chinese workers had at this stage in their history low levels of literacy. Uh, and this was a longer term problem that if you're going to upskill um, the population, that their education needed to be improved. And so at this stage, um, work that could be done that was unskilled was relatively easy to get sorted out. But the more sort of technologically advanced um, aspects of, of work were harder to um, integrate into the Chinese economy. And uh, finally, the, the Chinese were having to pay so much to the Soviet Union, um, not just for their help, but also to pay off the debts of the Korean War. That spending on areas like health and education um, was limited, much lower than that they would have planned for um, or preferred. And so standards of living, although they did rise, they didn't rise as quickly as would have been hoped. Nevertheless, broadly speaking, the first five-year plan can be seen as mostly successful with a few kind of areas um, of, of minor dissatisfaction. Now remember that this sits alongside um, the initial um, uh, collectivization, or initial stages of collectivization for agriculture, which were ideologically really successful in gathering the peasants into their mats and then into APCs, their, co their cooperatives, and then the HPCs um, by the mid 50s. So that uh, uh, ideologically, the the countryside had been communized, made more communist, um, although production in agriculture had not kept pace with um, urban requirements. So if you're asked a question about you know, how successful was Mao in economic management up to 1956, you'd probably say industrially 
his successes were bigger than his uh, agricultural output um, successes. Nevertheless, um, ideologically, in both cases, he's moved things forward. Um, and probably ideologically in the countryside, he's ahead of where he is perhaps uh, in the urban areas. Next time, uh, we'll go on to look at the second five-year plan, uh, seems sensible after the first, uh, and we'll consider um, where things go from here. See you then.